Consider some of the influences of societal or cultural ethics, especially those enshrined in various national laws. Think too about the dynamic, that is, the, the relations of power and resistance to that power, formed between those social ethics and an individual's personal morals or morality. Notice how in many nations, what a society enshrines as acceptable for its socio-cultural ethics and laws may be more or less equivalent to what many or some of its citizens actually believe and practice. But this isn't always the case, and diversity makes a difference. There are always some for whom the public ethic of their state, their culture, their laws or religious institutions are not always and everywhere identical or coterminous with an individual's own moral beliefs or their practices. Pause the video for a moment just to um, draw up a couple of lists, one showing examples from your field of professional practice concerning different cultural backgrounds or social or religious expectations on a person, with another list showing ways in which certain individuals may be different from these social or cultural expected norms. Don't forget to share your learning with us, please. A number of years ago, I wrote a chapter on sexuality in this current book showing here, St Stigma and Social Exclusion in Healthcare. All of us authors had to read a book by Edward E. Jones et al. on something called concealability and course. So how a stigma may be, may be hidden and what the course of that would be, or if the person came out about the stigma, what would be the course or outcome of that? These whole notions of concealability and course, however, may be applied much wider in relation to um, ethical dimensions of research and inquiry, because there are some times in which people's um, particular life ways or their identities or stigmas attached to them may mean that they're hidden. And therefore, when we are inquiring or researching, how do we know we're finding everyone if some people are hidden? A really good example here is the case of female genital cutting or female genital mutilation. What if someone has had female genital cutting performed without their consent, for example as a child, but now in adult life they consider it an essential part of being to make them acceptable within their own people? Consider that example further then. What happens if that particular individual comes to another country, one that now considers such cutting to be mutilation and a breach of the individual's human rights? How is this individual going to balance or resolve the tensions formed between what they perceive as a normal part of their cultural being when now in a society which considers it quite different? When a person feels at variance or incongruent with their own cultural ethics and expectations or their particular legal obligations, there may be a concealment, a hiding of who they really perceive themselves to be. This very much taps into the old saying about that many people are frightened of being rejected or frightened of not being accepted, warts and all. <laughs>